Hello, I'm Doug Musio. This is City Talk. He was America's mayor decades before Rudy Giuliani. He was a controversial figure angering conservative Republicans and regular Democrats. He was a national spokesman for cities and the people who lived in them. He was a champion of black women's and gay rights. He was the first media mayor, a well-intentioned but naive liberal, and our tallest mayor before Bill de Blasio. He's John Lindsay, New York City's 103rd mayor, and he's the subject of Joseph Vitoridi's just published book, Summer in the City, John Lindsay, New York and the American Dream. It's a collection of essays on the mayor and his many legacies. Joe is the Thomas Hunter Professor of Public Policy and Chair of the Urban Affairs and Planning Department at Hunter College. He specializes in education policy, state and local governance, and public law. He's the author of 10 books, numerous articles, and essays. He has an extensive record of public service in New York and elsewhere. Also joining us is Sam Roberts. Sam is the urban affairs correspondent for the New York Times. He's been with the Times since 1983, where he has served as a city affairs columnist and deputy editor of the Week in Review. Prior to the Times, Sam worked for 15 years at the Daily News. He's won multiple journalism awards and has authored eight other books, including the 2010 collection, America's Mayor, John V. Lindsay and the Reinvention of New York. Sam covered Lindsay beginning in 1969 as a New York Daily News reporter. Welcome, Joe. Welcome, Sam. Thank, Thank you, Doug. You. Okay. We're all just about contemporaries, and we sort of cut our teeth in the Lindsay years. What are you doing in, in 1965 to 69, and then as you are a reporter at the Daily News? What are you covering? Getting out of college, uh, starting at the Daily News in 1968, and my first big assignment covering City Hall for the Daily News beginning early in 1969 and covering an administration that is running for a hard-fought re-election, uh, facing a Republican primary that it ultimately loses, uh, probably the best thing that happened to John Lindsay, because then he could run more or less as an independent, run on things that don't necessarily relate to city government, runs on the war in Vietnam, uh, runs on uh, civil rights, runs on issues that aren't necessarily related to his management of city government runs on the larger issues of the great society uh, rather than necessarily on his management of city government and that probably turns out to be a good thing for him. One single memory incident during the, that, that first assignment. Uh, well the most important thing in that campaign I think was David Garth who was his media maven persuading John Lindsay to do a commercial and uh, there are various uh, uh, um, debates over how many takes that commercial took on the back porch of uh, Gracie Mansion, admitting that he made mistakes. Uh, he never really says, I made a mistake. He never really says, I'm sorry, per se. But it's a commercial worth watching because he says when it came to school decentralization, when it came to uh, picking up the snow and shoveling the snow in Queens, uh, his administration didn't do what it was supposed to They blew to. it. I mean, yep. being a Queens boy, I mean... 1968, 69 was not a good and, year. And to get a politician to admit then or now that he or she made a mistake was a pretty impressive feat. Joe, you, you were there in, in one sense as well. Talk about how you were there. Well, I was, still, I was a student at Hunter College, and I got a job working in Mayor Lindsay's office. I would be called an intern today. And what I, my job was to answer the phone. And so when people ask me if I, if I remember the snowstorm, I say, yes, I do. When people called out the mayor to curse him out, I picked up the phone and, hear, and I heard it. And did you do it verbatim? Uh, <laughs> well, they wanted to talk to the mayor, but he, he wasn't usually available. And, um, and it was the heat of the period. I mean, it was, I was around 1969 when I worked there. Why Lindsay? It was an extraordinarily exciting time in politics. 
not only in New York, but in the country. Here we are in the middle, the beginning really of the civil rights movement. The, the, the act is passed in 64. Voting Rights Act is passed in 65. Lindsay was part of that history. Lindsay served, served seven years in the House of Representatives. Mm -hmm. People don't r remember this, but a higher proportion of Republicans voted for civil rights than Democrats because right. Southern mm -hmm. Democrats control the sure. committee. So people like Lindsay were very important. And it was a time when liberal or progressive Republican was not an oxymoron. There was such things. It's and interesting. they were an important part of, yeah. of the coalition. In right. Joe's book, I mean, he makes a point. First of all, this was not long after the Kennedy assassination. Right. People were looking for a hero. Yep. And you point out in the book that uh, this was a precursor, if you will, of Occupy Wall Street. This was a movement. Right. Uh, it was saving the city, if you will. It was a city that was sort of moribund. It was a city that was uh, locked into patterns set for years by the Democratic machine. And here was someone coming along who appeared to be a savior, appeared to be offering something new, uh, and people were excited about it. And Murray Clinton's famous line about that he is fresh yeah. when everybody else is tired, referring primarily to Mayor Wagner. Why did, you, why did you write the book on Lindsay? Why Lindsay? Why now? I, it wasn't planned. Um, a few years ago, the Museum for the City of New York um, did this wonderful exhibit, which coincided with the publication of this wonderful book of, of Sam's book. And I was, and there were a number of conferences built around it. I was invited to speak at the last conference, and it got me thinking about Lindsay again. And I, I said, "Boy, what a what a fascinating time!" And there really hasn't been a lot written about him. Um, there's the Canado book. Uh, right, which is an important book right. and a solid book, but it's written from a very right of center, center perspective, right. as Vin Vincent would tell you. Um, but we're, we have the Morris's benefit, book is your and point. Charlie Morris's book, which was but wonderful, the, and he's in course, here. Of course, the good um, intentions in both books, your book and yours. Yeah, but we have the benefit of hindsight now in the right. sense that we're, we're, here we are in the 21st century, and we've seen the city take a certain direction. And I think it allows us to appreciate Lindsay in a different, different way than we might have before. I think both books really contextualize him in a way that hadn't been done in the past, really. John Lindsay and his times. And, and, and you note in the book how these two books really complement each other very well, both substantively as well as the richly photographed and illustrated uh, America's mayor and the more, if you will, more scholarly. But nonetheless, this is great stuff. You have. I don't great mind people. you calling. No, 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 no. Joe, uh, Joe, and I. I take was going to take exception a, to that. No, you would have taken I thought exception. it sounded less interesting. No, no, no. It's no, not. But, it's, but don't it's you're very actually right about that. And people lose sight of you're the in context. <laughs> uh, lose sight of the context and perspective because it really was. I hate to admit, a long time ago. And this is a very, very different city, and they don't realize the context in which John Lindsay ruled. Uh, and when you judge a mayor, any mayor, or maybe any public official, you judge them by the problems they inherited, uh, you judge them by the resources they're able to marshal to deal with those problems, and you judge them by the legacy uh, they were able to leave. And I think Lindsay, like any mayor, has to be judged by the, those criteria. It was one of the most exciting times in American history in Washington. And people were leaving the government in Washington to come and work at City Hall mm -hmm. in New York. Fred Hayes, who was one of the great management mm -hmm. gurus of all time, left Washington to come here and work for John Lindsay. And, and it has never really hasn't been covered sufficiently. I think we do it well in the book. Yes, Rogers excellent. Does it. Gives the, the uh, perspective on the management innovations that became a foundation for lots of things in New York, like the management plan and financial manager. Things that happened during that period were extraordinary, it, and the, the talent is amazing. It really is, and it, and it struck me how little I really knew. At the same time, I had a real feel, feeling of deja vu. The transit strike. I had nine of my friends staying in my room up at Fordham because they couldn't get home <laughs> and we had finals and then you had Ocean Hill Brownsville you had you know the, the rioting you had 
the snowstorm. And you remember those things, but what you don't remember or never knew in the first place are the management reforms, the 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 use of arts and culture and, 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 and architecture to define the city. Okay. Now and there were a lot of things that didn't work. Right. Okay. I mean, but he was willing to experiment. Uh, he was willing to take a chance. He was willing to fail uh, and did on occasion. You know, Jay Kriegel, who was uh, one of the the bright young men of that administration, uh, said that they were willing to take a chance. And the only thing they didn't do uh, was have enough grown-ups around them when they came in. Right. The the, the lack of Bill Hayes came. <laughs> yeah. In a sense, the lack of adults. I, yeah, yeah we had, not enough Jay adults. Right. Right. Which is right. interesting because that's something that Bill de Blasio is doing. That's exactly right. See, what's interesting about these books is what struck me are the real parallels between then and now, even though the times they have, I mean, your first chapter is the times they are changing and they have changed dramatically, but there's a lot of continuity here. You know? There isn't, there Go isn't. Go. Um, I think for Lindsay, it was a bit more racial justice. For yep. de Blasio, it's economic justice. Right, more class. I think Lindsay also had certain disadvantages. The labor unions at that point, to me, politically, were very backwards. They were, they were really defending the ethnic villages that existed in the various city agencies. Today, I think you can say that the labor unions are much more of a force for progressive politics, particularly when you're dealing with economic inequality issues. Lindsay had the advantage of going to Washington for help. De Blasio is not going to have help from Washington. Washington or, is or not the state, the, or, or the Albany. state for that matter. Right. So there are lots of differences here. There's, there's obvious, I think there are obvious comparisons to make because they're both progressives, but the, the politics of the time were very different. I mean, you know, in the end, de Blasio is a populist. He, he got elected because he talked about economic injustice. Lindsay was going against the tide when he was, he was supporting uh, minorities who were just arriving in the city who weren't voting. Right. I mean, the, the blacks were not, didn't have the habit of voting when they were coming from the South. And, you know, you know, because of the work you do in, 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 in voting behavior, voting is, is very much correlated with economic sure. and, and social indicators. And so he was really moving, he was, he was representing a population of people who were not there politically. He was very bold. I mean, some people, I guess it's fair to say he was somewhat naive, but I think he was also very principled. He came with an agenda that was very, I mean, you could, you could see his body of work begin in Congress and what he, he stood for something. And he was willing to take risk, as Sam said. That's, that's very unusual in politics. It's particularly unusual today. You have a wonderful line in the book saying he may have failed at accounting but excelled at philosophy. philosophy. <laughs> now, now, the question that, that I asked immediately afterwards, the people who vote for the mayor of New York want philosophy or do they want the garbage cleaned up and crime reduced? But clearly there's that element of it. So, but there was a certain element of naivete. Sure. And I think there's also... And youth. Yeah, and youth, and I think also both of your books point out that there was a, sort of a moralistic tone to it that brooked no compromise. So at the same, the transit strike is a classic example of laying down the markers, being extremely no compromise, and then taking a beating. Mm -hmm. I mean, his first day on the job, he's confronted with the strike, and he settles it 12 days later at triple the cost, and the unions learn a lesson, and that is this guy can be had. So... Could he have done things differently? I mean, what was the nature of the situation? Given his agenda, let's, let, let's, let, let me step back for a second. Your chapter three deals with race, rights, and empowerment, and then talk about three major reforms. The CCRB, the community control of schools, and scatter, scatter site housing, which were all, in many ways, reforms that were appropriate in certain lights at the time that didn't happen but ultimately came to be either established policy or established wisdom. But at the time, he took huge beatings, starting with the CCRB. Mm -hmm. You know, he angered the police unions. 
They didn't want, and, and the police actively, what I, what I didn't realize in both these cases, they actively obstructed. What were the barriers that he faced locally? The barriers he, he faced was, was the political structure of the city. He was a Democrat in a Democratic city. He succeeded Bob Wagner, who was loved by organized labor. Bob Wagner made these labor leaders important. Right. They, didn't, they had no standing before him. Because, right. before him. And so anybody who followed Wagner was not going to be somebody who was going to be encouraged by, by organized labor. And he took on issues. The CCRB, Civilian Review Board issue, was something that needed to be done. The, the department was corrupt, the, and, as the NAP as the Commission, commission totally found later out. on. And, it, and, and as I said in the book, justice was very often administered at the end of a stick, particularly in black and Hispanic Puerto Rican neighborhoods. So he did what needed to be done. Um, it was, I mean, lots of people thought it was suicidal politically, but you know that was the period. Either you were going to take a stand that needed to be taken, or you weren't. But if you're going to turn the corner on issues like that, in the mid '60s, then somebody has to be bold he, enough to move ahead. He did it in an often counterproductive way. No, uh, on the CCRB, on the uh, demonstration school districts, putting all three of them in minority neighborhoods yeah. instead of one in Forest Hills or or Riverdale sure. or something like that. And you talk about the strategic and tactical errors. If he had been more political in the best sense of the word, right. I think he would have been more successful. But at the same time, both of you point out that. In a sense, there was a perfect storm mm -hmm. that he confronted. And not unique to New York, necessarily. Not, 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 not at all, because you have the loss of manufacturing. You have an, an energized black, more radical leadership. Yeah. You had yeah, middle, middle class people being re replaced by people who were poor. Right. You had poor people. You had the economy changing, so the jobs that would ordinarily be given to unskilled labor was disappearing. Right. You had you had businesses which would help with a quote redistributive agenda leaving town, and um, this all started before Lindsay. It was part of a national trend, and so it was a perfect storm politically and economically and dem demographically. The city was changing, uh, you know, enormously. And you had the seeds of a fiscal crisis Go ahead. that began under Bob Wagner. Right. In 1961, Wagner broke with the bosses, and he became firmly allied in the uh, you know, most obvious sense with organized labor, with liberals. Mm -hmm. They were the ones who re-elected him in 1961. Right. And he began, in effect, giving away the city. And that's where the fiscal crisis really began, you could argue. Yes, and, and, and both of, of, of your books point to the, the preceding conditions in the city that you know, constrain the mayor. I mean, People don't realize that the mayor's actions are so constrained by innumerable variables that expectations always exceed exceed performance. What are some of his greatest hits? I mean, if you were going to put down a list, column A and column B, what what is the significance of you're talking to my undergraduate New York City clerk? What under the hits? What is John Lindsay known for and ought to be? known and respected or honored I, for. Lindsay understood the civic mission of the city better than anyone in modern times since LaGuardia. Meaning? Um, he understood that we had to take care of our poor. Um, he understood that local democracy is important and that local, the workshop of, local de of democracy happens at the local level. And he tried to build institutions that would include people who are not, no, not included in government. He, um, he made some very bold, took some very bold steps uh, in terms of representation. He, he appointed a black fire commissioner. Mm -hmm. Even now, it would be considered provocative, to, I mean, because it's the whitest agency in and the city. Subject to and subject to court review, et cetera. And, and he, um, he made very conspicuous appointments. And he brought in a class of people uh, that, that, would be, that would serve as a leadership for the city in many administrations to come. Right. In that Even to the current day. In that civic uh, category, I would include uh, culture and architecture in the city as well. I would add uh, the, the leadership cadre that he brought, brought young people, mm. innovative people, enthusiastic people into government who went on to serve in many governments sure. after that. And let's not forget, you know, that it wasn't a perfect record, but he did keep the city 
relatively calm when other cities were not. I think, I, I, in some ways, the, the you know the the single photograph that always stuck in my mind. The walking it, the streets. It's walking the streets in his shirt sleeves. In a credible way. In a very credible way. The the rest of the country. I mean, the people don't understand now. And I try to communicate this to students. The sense of impending collapse. I mean, the world was collapsing. The the cities were rioting. We had the Vietnam War. You know, you had riots in in the neighborhoods and you had demonstrations uh, and, and we were streets. spared all of that for sure no it was a lot better it was a lot better there's one clearly. picture in, in sam's book where Lindsay's being carried on the shoulders yes of, of, mm -hmm. of the in the black neighborhood he's being carried on people's shoulders can you imagine that um, can you imagine that any other mayor in that right I mean, I mean <laughs> tremendous personal courage at the same time yeah. but and a sense of real understanding of how people act and what motivates them and, and, and what they appreciate in terms of leadership. And this is a period when it was dangerous. It was a period of political assassinations. I mean, there were snipers. You know, Come on. We saw Martin Luther King, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, and he's, he's and the police are warning him, don't, don't do this, and he's going in without very much protection. Mm -hmm. yeah. What else? Well, I'd like to ask Joe. Go. One thing he says in the book, and I, I just wonder what you mean, is that the next mayor, meaning the current mayor, can take a page from John Lindsay's book. Ah, thank you. Um, I think the page to take is to, uh, is to not to be afraid to stand on principle, that you need to take risk, that if we're going to take on issues that need to be taken on, they're going to be sometimes against your political instincts. That's why they're that way to begin with. And it takes courage. Uh, and it takes, it, it's, it's a very different mindset from politics today where we do, we do a po polling first and then we decide what position we're gonna take. I don't mean de Blasio, but, but others. And um, he didn't do that. He, he said, this is what we stand for. This is consistent with the record I've had all along. And this needs to be done, and we may lose, and we may win, but we'll move the we'll move the ball down the, down the field a little bit. That's the major uh, lesson from Lindsay. And again, I I continue to go back to the civic mission of the city, which I think has been lost in post fiscal crisis New York. I think we've become obsessed with fiscal survival, and I don't mean to say it's not important, but. Um, there are larger all purposes. decisions are made around that we can't get out of we can't get out of that post fiscal crisis mindset. Do you see any any resonances in Bill De Blasio's approach to the mayoralty to Lindsay? I, as I was reading this, I was trying to look at are there any models for De Blasio out there among mayors historically? And I went back through Bloomberg, Giuliani, Dinkins, Koch, Beam, and then I hit on Lindsay, and in some ways. Even though the context is different, the political environment's different. There, there, there's a real. I get the sense that there's a real similarity well, this along is, the lines that Joe's talking. There's about. a certain resonance. He's appointing sort of activists rather than uh, managers. In some cases, that could be a good thing or a bad thing. It mm -hmm. remains to be seen. Right. Uh, he clearly is going in with an agenda, something he believes in. He's not going in as a manager. Uh, again, that remains to be seen. Uh, and what he does with organized labor, which still has a lot of power. Uh, they may not have the, the same uh, agenda that they had before. They now may have an economic agenda, but they also have a level of self-interest. Sure. And it's going to uh, be very important to see whether de Blasio can persuade them that their self-interest and the city's interest, on, in some same. respects, coincide. Looking at Lindsay's worst moments, what are his worst moments? Where are the lessons for a current mayor or a future mayor to avoid? I what think, is the, I think the worst moment was Ocean Hills Brownsville mm -hmm. um, for a number of reasons. First of all. Does anyone remember what that was? Give us a little history. It, well, I mean. Well, was, either one. Go ahead. Um, it was the beginning of the decentralization movement. Uh, there were three experimental districts set up as I had noted in the book and, and Sam had noted, um, all the districts were set up in minority areas, which racialized the issue at a time when people in other districts were looking for vehicles for parental involvement. Right. It was a major strategic error on his part. He also made an extraordinary error by not intervening sooner. There were, there were teachers that were removed because 
they were Jewish and uh, white, white, and there was no there was no due process procedures involved, and that should not have been tolerated. So it, it was a grave mistake on his part, and it did polarize the city for years to come, black and white. Um, so I think it was and probably Jews and yeah, and Jews it, and I think blacks. it was the most damaging damaging episode of the entire administration. It was at the same time a lack of leadership and a lack of ability to compromise, to know when to pull the plug and say, okay, this is as far as we're going to get this time. We'll do more next year. I mean, if you look at Lyndon Johnson, if you see the new play all the way, I mean, there is the master politician <laughs> saying, this is as far as we're going to go. We'll get the rest of it next year or the year after. And he did. Joe, you, uh, at, the, at the end of the book, in, in your chapter 9, just a couple of quotes. Uh, you, you took one of them that, uh, that you know, he, he failed accounting but, but uh, passed uh, philosophy. You say, notwithstanding strategic and tactical errors, Lindsay's larger agenda was both honorable and courageous. Can you uh, use two other adjectives? Um, Forward-looking. I think he had a sense of history and where the country was going to eventually have to go. And where New York City and its and economy the, And where the city to had to go. And um, at times it didn't look inevitable, but um, we had to open things up to blacks and women and gays. He's somebody who, who, who started talking about issues of gay rights before mm -hmm. anybody sure. else was. The well, city Stonewall council, happens during uh, yeah, his administration. The city council tries to pass a law, and it fails, and he, he passes an executive order on right. his own. He came out for women's rights. When McS McSauley's didn't want to serve, serve women, he, he got a bill, he got something passed that said, you can't do this. And so he was way ahead of his time. He opened up Central Park. He said, this is not a boulevard. This is a place where people should ride bikes and skate and walk and stroll. It's a park. And he kind of changed the way we, we view and use Central Park. He closed it down to traffic. He, he was one of the early people who talked about environment. You know, the, the Environmental Protection Agency just, it wasn't just a bureaucratic move. It was saying that we need to look at the environment holistically. So it's not just removal of garbage. It's dealing with air pollution. It's dealing with water pollution. It's, it's, it's a much broader agenda. He was way ahead of his time on this kind of stuff. Sam, you got 15 seconds. Final assessment. In, in a sense, write the headline for John Lindsay. Misunderstood, and as uh, Joe says in the book, history has not been kind to him, and he probably deserved better. Ooh, yeah, I think so. My thanks to Joe Vitoretti and Sam Roberts for their insights and observations about Mayor Lindsay and his administration. Join us next week here on CUNY TV. Excellent.